notice this. You go into a store and they go, are you a rewards member? <laughs> have, you, have you signed up for our rewards program? You're, you're part, I see that you're part of the rewards um, program. And then you, you sign up for the rewards program. And then um, about a year later, they give you a, a check in the mail for 78 cents. <laughs> What am I doing? This is ridiculous. They just, it was just me to get, get my address or email or whatever the thing was. Then they start giving you the things in the mail, get in our rewards program. God has a rewards program. He's the, really, he's the originator of the rewards program. He has a good rewards program, though. Good benefits. He's a rich daddy. And um, let's turn to the book of First Kings. We'll start off there. First Kings. God has a rewards program. 1 Kings chapter 7, and whether you know it or not, you're signed up. The moment you got saved, you got signed up for the rewards program. 1 Kings chapter 7. We're reading about Solomon here. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 7. Then he made a porch for the throne where he might judge, even the porch of judgment. Let's go over to Psalm 9. Psalm 9. He, he prepares a porch for a throne where he's going to judge. Psalm 9. So what we want to start off right out of the gate. God is a judge. Psalm 9. Verse 7, we read, But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared His throne for judgment. Let's go over to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Verse 10, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll begin in verse 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built there upon, he shall receive a reward." If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 9. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, whether it be good or bad. So again, God is a judge. He gives out reward. Now, that word reward in the Bible, we think of reward, we always think of something good, right? You get a reward, you get a good thing. The Bible frequently uses the word reward. Sometimes, you're, sometimes you get something good. Sometimes you get something not good. So I think of anything more often than not when the Bible uses the word reward, it, it, it talks about it in a way that you have something not good coming to you. You have wrath coming your way. Again, we just want to understand some of the, the, the big, big, big picture of some of this stuff. Other words that we're looking at that are similar to repay, to render, to requite. Jeremiah calls him the God of recompenses. He's a God that, again, distributes Reward, good or bad. Now, when we're looking here in Second Corinthians, we read, for all, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he had done, 
Now here, this is going to get into some deep theology. Ready? All right. Two, two categories. They're not complicated. Whether are the things are good or the things are bad. Right? We could teach that to the kids in Sunday school. Again, not a, not a complicated thing. The things done in his body, and they're, they're according to some things. They're according to whether they're good or whether they are bad. Our conversation, our service, our walk today affects the outcome of that judgment. Two categories, good and bad. Again, when we're reading that other passage, we read, we read it broken down, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Again, what we're talking about in the big picture is we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ, specifically, and in the, in what exactly that judgment is. So here's a, here's a question. It's kind of a rhetorical question, but just out of curiosity. Would you like to have reward that endures through that judgment? Yes or no? Show of hands. How many people would like to have good works come out? Okay. Work that's acceptable, work that's good, gold, silver, precious stones. Okay, so it's pretty, pretty universally accepted that that's, that's what, um, what you would naturally want to do. Now let's go over to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. So here lies the problem. It's hard to be good, right? I can't remember who said it. It, it, it. You know, you're so good at being bad and so bad at being good, right? It's hard to be good. Galatians... Chapter 5, verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. I've got to modify that. It's not, it's, not, it's not difficult. It's impossible. Let's go back to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. So we're all familiar with what's going on here in Romans chapter 7. There's a... There's a problem that's being addressed here is I, I want to do good. I want to do good. I want to get those rewards. I, I want to please the Father. I just don't know how to do it. I can't, I can't find in me a way to make that happen. When I want to do good, I end up doing bad. The things that I hate, those are the things that I end up doing. And, and there's, a, um, there's, a, there's a problem here. Again, so in, in um, Romans chapter 7, again, we, we see this issue. Now, thankfully, right after Romans chapter 7, we got what? Romans chapter 8. God says, well, you know, with you it is impossible. But I can do this. I can perform this work in you. I can do something that you're incapable of doing, Romans chapter 8. And we see again that there's, there's this new thing that's happening when you got saved, you had, you had, you had something, some, some amazing things happen to you the moment that you got saved. One of the things that happened, obviously, is, is God himself began to indwell you for the first time. You have, you, have the, you have the power of God inside of you. Again, so he's able to accomplish some things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do. Romans chapter 8, let's go down to verse 9 real quick. But you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be, that the spirit of God dwell in you. Does the spirit of God dwell in you? Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Do you have the Spirit of Christ? Sure you do. Again, so now you, have, now you have two components, if you could say it like that. Really, what they're doing is they're working in tandem. And you have somebody, again, which is Christ in the believer. So although the Christian life is God's work in us, it also requires and expects our participation and obedience of faith. So that's really... The issue there, again, is so, so there, there's really a, a combination. Let's go to the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians, chapter 2. And then we'll get 2 Corinthians 10. Let's get 2 Corinthians 10 and Galatians 2. So, you, again, you have something really beautiful indescribable happening in, inside, of, inside of your life. And there's, there's a combination of two things happening. Um, we'll, we'll start here in Galatians, um, 
chapter 2, we'll read this one first. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul writes, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So someone says, well, it's none of me. It's got to be all of him. He does all of the work. I do none of the work, which means basically I'm just kind of here for the ride. I can, I can sit back and do nothing. And um, again, maybe let him do everything. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse... Five, we read, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into, here it is, into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now there is, in reality, there is a, um, a responsibility in our end where you, again, of obedience. And again, this is a, this is a, um, a delicate dance, if you could say it like that. Um, does anybody know what that is? That's a sloth. Now, does, do you think God chooses to have... The Bible uses the word sloth, actually, quite a bit. Um, and n never in a complimentary way. D does God want your Christian life to be described as someone who's slothful? Say, well, I'm just going to sit on the couch because Christ is doing all the work anyway. And I don't really ever have to get up and roll up my sleeves and actually do anything. I'm just going to let him not I but Christ... Again, um, so it's, what we see here is there's a combination here. Let's go back to Romans chapter 8 again. Romans chapter 8. There's a solution to how this victory can be won. We've been talking about this quite a bit in our group. Now, again, it's not, it's not a complicated thing. We don't have to make it rocket science when it's not rocket science. We don't, we don't have to... We don't have to make it a curriculum when it's not a curriculum. Romans 8 describes a very simple thing. How do you, how do you, how do, you do good things? Walk in the Spirit. Not, not a difficult thing. Right? I can only walk in one direction at a time. I don't know about you, but that's why, you know, sometimes you walk around and people don't know where you're going because you're pacing and you're confused. But I can't walk this way and walk this way at the same time. I can only, I can only walk in one direction or I can walk in the other direction. Sometimes I start walking one way, and then I decide, you know what, i got to start walking over this way. Again, not, not a complicated thing. Galatians chapter 5, we read, but if you be led of the Spirit. Really, again, kind of maybe an odd illustration, but there's a dance going on in, inside of your life. Someone's leading that dance. Someone should be leading that dance, right? Not you. Being led... Of the Spirit, he's he's the one that does the leading. You know, again, you ha you have to make a choice to have somebody else lead. That's a hard thing for us to do, right? We don't we don't want to do that naturally. How do you let somebody else? And again, we see it in all aspects. How do you let somebody else lead? Submit. Submission. It's, again, it's, 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 it's that simple. The 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 obedience. Again that we're reading about. Um, we don't need to make it more complicated than God makes it. Walk in the Spirit, be led of the Spirit. Now, i got a problem in my life. I don't know, again, about you. This is a little bit of a confessional. I think bad thoughts. Maybe you think bad thoughts, or the person next to you thinks bad thoughts. You know, I think it's a gift, actually, that we don't know each other's thoughts. <laughs> You know, I don't think that we would have a conference next year if we knew each other's thoughts. That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a gift that God gave us, right? So now the problem is the bad thoughts that I get is they produce some other bad things. They produce motivation that's bad. They produce an attitude that's bad. They produce desires that are bad, that are unfruitful. Again, at the end of the day, they produce bad things. Produce bad fruit. I don't want that in my house, right? Is that that's not something that's acceptable? Again, it's something that I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to get rid of that. So God has a, a program, a plan. He says, "Well, I'm going to, I'm going to take care of these bad thoughts, these bad attitudes, these bad motivations." What we need to do is we need to start getting you to think right. That's simple. 
you got bad thinking, now we need to start getting you thinking properly. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. <coughs> so God has a, a program, a plan. I want to produce good fruit. I want to produce good. Again, we've just established that. Why? Because I'm going to be judged. And it's going to be according to things, whether they're good or bad. I want some good things to offer up. So I want some, I want some good fruit. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The renewing of your mind. You know, when I first got into this book, one of the things that I noticed is I started reading the Bible a little bit, and I thought, man, Backwards God. I can't believe that he thinks this way. What, a, what, a, what an ignorant, dumb God. If I was God, I would do this. And then, and then I started thinking about some stuff, and then you learn something, you get a little bit more in your soul, and you go, oh, he was right. I was wrong. His thinking was the right thinking. My thinking was the bad thinking. He was renewing my mind to start thinking about things a little bit differently, starting to esteem the things that he esteems. And over the course of time, what happens? The renewing of my mind. All of a sudden, I start thinking about things on his terms. Maybe I'm motivated by the things that would motivate him. Maybe I have attitudes that would reflect his attitudes. Maybe I would actually desire something that he might desire, and they're going to be radically different things. Now, we're, we're, for time's sake, we're not going to go through all of this. We look, we look at the issue of the law. You've got all these commandments in the law, and they get, they, get, they get summed down, funneled down. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Not complicated. Again, not, not, not an easy thing to do. The issue is my thinking has to change. My heart has to change. I have to have a heart for the things that he has a heart for. I have to, again, renew my mind. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1. <coughs> well, again, he's got some ways to accomplish this. 1 Timothy chapter 1. The end of the renewing of this mind, and again, this is an ongoing process, needless to say. Verse 5, I read, now the end of the commandment is, is here, it is charity, agape love, choosing to serve somebody else, waking up in the morning and thinking, what can I do for them, instead of what can I do to feed, feed myself. Charity out of a pure heart, a change of heart, and a, a good conscience and a faith Unfeigned. Let's go over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul writes, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And as we're going to go through here, but it's a, it's a mind of humility, obedience, service. Again, that, that issue of um, the, the obedience of faith. And then the end result, obviously, is acceptable fruit. Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The end result is now, as my mind starts to change, all of a sudden, I got some, I got some good fruit out on the table. I got some things that are, are acceptable. Things that, things that have now changed the inner man. Again, maybe I'm going to start to esteem things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have motivations that are going to reflect a renewed mind 
let's go back to, our, well, here we're, we're in Philippians. Let's go to, down to verse 13. You know, we get this issue of motivation. Anybody, anybody in the business world or anybody who has kids, you know, it's difficult to motivate people sometimes, right? Anybody who's a pastor knows that. You know, you try to motivate your congregation. Sometimes they're, they're not having it. And you think, man, what else could I possibly be doing? How, how more can I motivate them? You know, how, how can I say it in a different way? Again, you read the verses and, um, you know, we scratch our heads. How does this happen? Verse 13, for it is God which worketh in you, here it is, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God creates that motivation. The word of God working in their mind, getting, getting down, penetrating into that heart, choosing to be motivated by the things that would motivate him. Paul writes, for the love of Christ constraineth us. We know that idea, right? You, you, you just pushes you on. I can't, I can't do this anymore. Something's constraining me. It's like I've got a wind behind, behind me that just, just, just pushes me towards this. The, the love of Christ. Why, why do you keep doing what you're doing? You could be doing something else. You could do something else with your money. The love of Christ constraining me pushing me along, motivating me to do some things that make absolutely no sense to the world. Considering things from his perspective, we say in our family to have an attitude of gratitude. Just be, be thankful. Just, 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 just being thankful for the things that you have, having a positive attitude, something that simple, having de- desires that reflect a renewed mind, valuing and esteeming what he esteems what he values. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We just bought a, we just got a car, my wife and I, we went to, uh, it was a new car for us. It, was, it wasn't a new car, but it was new for us. And we went, to the, we went to the dealer and got it a couple weeks ago, and just for fun, it was a high-end dealer, not that it's a high-end car. And we went into some of the, the rooms that they have, super nice cars. So as we're waiting for the, Salespeople, I thought, you know, I'm going to go in there just to, just to take a peek. Beautiful vehicles. Just the, just the ambiance that they have in the room. And then you go up just out of curiosity. I've got to see what these price tags are. 116000 140000 160000 And you go, whoa. Kids, don't touch anything. <laughs> in fact, if, get out of this room. Get out of this room. So we started talking to the guy afterwards, the, the manager, just for fun. I said, you know, just out of curiosity, you must have some you know, famous people, celebrities, athletes. People come in here and buy some of these vehicles. What, what are some of the nicest cars that you ever sold? He said, well, you know, we had one that was in here. It was worth a million dollars. And he said, you know, when we work on it, well, the owner wants us to do this. We sign a contract to do this. We surround the car with velvet ropes before you work on it you got to sign a form of what you're doing and then you put on white gloves what do you, what do you think this guy esteems where's where's his heart well where's where again where, where's 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 the heart <clears throat> nowhere in and again we know this preachers one of the last things the preachers like to talk about is is financial giving but contrary to popular um, opinion, but nowhere in your life does that reflect your mind or your heart as it does in what you do with your treasure. You know, some, sometimes people can see these things that are relative, and they say, "Well, you know, this guy maybe he's a billionaire, maybe you know he's he's got a million dollar car." But you know, when I have somebody pull up in the parking lot and they got a seventy thousand dollar SUV, and they crumple up ten bucks and put it in the plate we got a problem. They're not valuing the things that God values. They're not esteeming the things that God esteems. And again, there, there's, there's some issue with that. God gives reward, the end result of the thing. Now, just, just imagine for a second. You think about a million dollars. I know that this would be a difficult thing. Just imagine for a second. If 500 people this year 
He gave a check for $1,000 to Grace School of the Bible. Think what that could do for this ministry. You know, half a million dollars. If 500 people gave a check for $2,000, we could buy that car. <laughs> and we could each have it for a day. <laughs> so again, the end, the end results. Let, let's, let's go back to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. So that's our goal. 2 Corinthians... Chapter 5, again, not, not, not that we need to make this any more complicated than it is. The product of the thing, again, is good fruit. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, in verse 10, whether it be good or bad. This is good stuff. I get the renewing of my mind, then I can produce some good fruit. I can produce some things that are acceptable, and I can produce some things. Now, the, you know, the fruit that you have because of those rewards, which, which do you think is going to last longer, that million-dollar car or the reward that you have that's eternal? That's a no-brainer. If you're, if you're going to invest in something, that's the sure bet. That, that, that's, that's the thing that, 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 you're going to, that you're going to put your money down on. So now here, when we're, when we're looking at all of this, Information. This is the, the thing. You're alive on planet Earth right now, today. This is it. This is, this is your opportunity right now. Again, to have some of these things working in you. You know, my family and I, we, we like a game. We're not, we're not diehard baseball fans. I don't know if you guys knew that there was a baseball game back in seven games. Back in October, the Cubs actually ended up winning. Can I get an amen? Somebody? <laughs> They ended up, they ended up uh, winning, winning this game, and we're watching this game, and, you know, I got sucked into it. At, the fir- at first, I, you know, we're, we're from Pennsylvania, and I'm not going to lie. I was almost torn. I said, man, I got so many friends there, Indians fans. And the Cubs haven't won in a long time. I don't even know who I'm going to root for, really. Well, you know, you start getting sucked into that game, and inevitably, you're, you know, you go for the underdog, and, you know, as the game's going, all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're, we're wearing Cubs gear, head to toe, screaming, you know, our, 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 our family and just the stress. By game seven, you're, you're walking around, you, you can't eat. <laughs> We're pacing. You don't know if you want to eat more potato chips or watch the game. I can't watch this anymore. I've got to go to bed. It's, dri- it's driving you crazy. Then all of a sudden, this guy comes out in the 10th inning, and I'm looking at this guy, and I'm thinking, man, he has got the weight of the world on him right now. He looked nervous. He looked cool, but he looked nervous. Just just trying to trying to keep his trying to keep his composure, trying to keep his trying to keep his cool. The hour has arrived doing what he came to do. Focus. Focusing on again what what he did. Now there's a man Again, we're reading about him in second or, or in Philippians two. Um, he did have the, the the weight of the world on his shoulders, on his on his back. The, the weight of the universe, the the universe hung in the balance on what was about to occur. Just the, just the, you talk about stress. Drop, drops as if they were drops of blood. Incredible anxiety. Incredible stress that went along with that. You know, with this, with this game, one of the things, they had a rain delay. Cleveland fans are still complaining about that. And um, during that rain, rain delay, what happened is one of the players, they were in the dugout, they went into one of the weight, the weight room, and the player said, um, we're the best team in baseball for a reason. We were going to win this game. He said that was the that was the changing point. We're going to go out there and then we're going to we're going to win this game. Complete confidence, complete attitude. Again, um, behold, we go up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. They shall condemn him to death, and he shall. 
and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit on him, and shall kill him. This is happening. No question. This is happening. Again, just that, that, just that incredible focus. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. For this cause came I unto this hour. You know, I'm watching this guy, and I'm thinking, you know, he's, he, he's trained for it. He's played his whole life waiting for this moment. The, the Savior had this, had this moment in mind, knew it was coming. Here, here it is. Now, now's, the, now's the time. Sacrifice like a lamb, but, you know, inside, internally, he was a, he was a roaring lion. Complete confidence. Russell, uh, Brother Russell just read that passage in Isaiah. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Who's going who's gonna to win this battle? Who, bring it on. Who's, who's going to defeat me? Complete confidence. Talk about those players going back. And we will win this game. I will go to the cross. I will be obedient unto death. My father will raise me up again. Complete focus, complete positive attitude. Let us stand together. Who's my adversary? Let him come near to me. Who's, who's going who's gonna, to who's gonna stop me from doing this? Read that passage there once again, saying, Behold, we go to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit on him, and shall kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. The, vic the victory is there. The victory is certain again. Matter of fact, today, again, is the opportunity that we have, again, for reward. The moment is now. <clears throat> so we ask our question, we ask ourselves this question, well, what, what does our apostle say about these things? How do, we, how, do we, how do we get some of these rewards? How do, how do we take this moment? You know, that player could have stayed in the dugout and said, I'm not, I can't go out there. I'm just... I'm just too nervous. Can't do it. Can't, can't sleep. Again, at some point, he's got to go on and do that. So we say, what, is, what does Paul say about these things? Stay focused on eternal things. I heard recently, and it's really true, some people, Christians, they're so focused on eternity that they never think about today. Some Christians are so focused on today, this life, that they never focus on eternal things. The choices that we make today in this life affect eternal things. Again, we don't want to just be that sloth sitting on the couch going, well, I'm just here biding my time until I get up to, until I get up to glory. Again, there, there, there are some things that are, are affecting us. Stay, stay focused. Christ says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Don't worry about the stuff. You, you, you have a rich daddy. He's got stuff. He's got plenty of stuff to give you. Don't, don't focus on his stuff. Love him because he's your father. Serve him because he's your father. Focus on his kingdom. Again, that's a, that's a trans-dispensational issue there. Focus on what he's doing. Stuff's going to get added. Don't, 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 don't focus on those things. Again, focus on, on what he's focusing on. 2 Timothy chapter 2. <coughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now, now the, the issue here is this. There's a threat, right, that, that we get distracted. I don't know about you. I get easily distracted. It doesn't take, it doesn't take too much. The cares of, of life, they just, they just start coming at you, don't they? You know, today, I think we have it worse than any generation ever. You know, you go home and you, and you turn on your TV. Everybody's trying to sell you something. 
You drive down the street, they're trying to sell you something. You need a bigger SUV. Your life would be more complete if you had that $140,000 car. You're, you're, you're going you're to you're be a better you if you only had this. Stresses, again, that come along. Second Timothy chapter 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also, what we're doing here in this ministry. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Think about it like uh, getting tangled up wrestling. Think of like a, like a rope just wrapped around you and you try to get out and then it's got another little thing. It, just that image of being, being tangled up in the affairs, consuming your mind, thinking about them 24-7. I got to take care of this. 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 What about the ministry that will take care of itself? I got my problems. I got my issues to take care of. I have my own affairs to take care of, entangled in those things. Paul says to Timothy, don't do that. Don't, don't get obsessed by those things. Stay focused. Stay focused on, on, on what you're doing. The end result is reward. Again, we just read that passage that everyone, well, that's good news. Everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Being grace-minded, producing good fruit, having the proper and correct Christ-like motivation, attitudes, and desires. You know, we had a, uh, um, I think back, you know, when I was younger, a, a uh, Christmas would roll around and we'd have some cousins that would come over. They were always a little, little younger than us, so in their defense. And, you know, Christmas morning would come around and then they'd, they'd come over, the doorbell would ring. And you'd open up the door and instantly, what'd you get? What'd you get? What'd you get? What'd you get? This is what I got. What did you get? What did you get? What'd you get? What'd you get? Every year. So we'd always laugh about that. Here they come. What'd you get? <laughs> so we said, you know, this year when they come in and say, what'd you get? What'd you get? We've got to say, we got, we got love in our heart. <laughs> just to kind of bug them a little bit, you know? Just, you know, we, 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 got, the, we, got, the, we got the love. We got the love of... Uh, Christ in our heart. He's the reward. Again, Br Brother Ed's going to be talking about that a little bit. You know, you wonder, what is that reward? He, he says that to Abraham. You're looking for a reward? I'm your reward. I'm not just your reward. I am your great, exceeding reward. What'd you, what'd you get? What'd you get? What'd you get at the judgment? I got a great, exceeding reward. What on earth could be better than that. I mean, what, anything else is secondary, right? What on earth could be a better reward than him? That's good. That's, uh, that's again, and, and more, more importantly, it's sufficient. Does he, does he have stuff for us? He's got stuff. That stuff, that stuff gets added. Again, that's, that's, not the, that's not the issue. Now, let's go over to 2 Corinthians Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <coughs> Verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to how well he preached to Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Let's go, let's go over to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. You know, we're Bereans. We study what the scriptures say, but you also got to pay attention to, as, as was mentioned last night, what they don't say. Don't put words in verses that don't exist. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 11 it's a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we're Pauline, we shall also reign with him. Chapter 2, 
chapter 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that are mid-Acts dispensationalists. Those that love is appearing. I think there's some individuals that love is appearing that were not mid-Acts dispensationalists. According to that verse, they got, they got a crown coming to them, right? Somebody mentioned Tyndale the other day. Um, first guy to translate the Bible into English. Here's the reward that the world gave him. Well, first they strangled him to death. And then they burned his body. Would you say that that's a guy who has suffered for Christ? Is that godly suffering? I, w I, would, I would classify that as being godly suffering. Whether he knew anything or, or not about, again, Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, he knew something about suffering. He knew something about standing in the light that he had. Don't think for two seconds that the God of this Bible isn't going to reward that. Again, that's, a, that's an issue. And really what it is, is as, as we're looking through this, let's go back to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. It's, all, it's always the mother that's going to embarrass you, right? Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Who knows? We're reading about the, the, the sons of thunder. Verse 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. She's got a desire. And he said unto her, what wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these, my two sons, may sit the one on, on thy right hand and the other on thy left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what you ask. Are ye able to drink the cup that I shall drink of? And so on. Now, verse down to, let's skip down to verse 24. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. How dare you? But Jesus called un them unto him and said, You know, teaching opportunity, that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and that they are great exercise authority, and they exercise great authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your. Mind of Christ. Love of Christ. Completely different attitude. Desiring what he desires. Serve. Again, that's a, that's a completely different mindset, a completely different attitude. Let's go back to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Now, again, don't think for two seconds that the God of this book doesn't reward those Glorify those. Again, give reward to those that serve him and that have this mind. Now, we talk about, you know, we look at that baseball player out there. You know, never lose sight of the fact that people talk about, you know, God becoming a man. There's a man sitting on the throne of God right now. He talks about the man, Christ Jesus. 100% man. We don't, want to, we don't want to lose sight of his humanity. A, a man took that cross. A man decided to go to Jerusalem. A, a man made that conscious effort of obedience. Well, how, how obedient was he? Even to death. The death of the cross. That's pretty obedient. So again, we're, re we're reading about him, verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Here it is. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. 
and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, his, his, his name connected with his humanity, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. That every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's go back to Second Timothy. Again, there, there is a result of the obedience and the suffering that he went through. He's magnified. He's glorified. And he's, he's, he's rewarded is what happened. Paul, our pattern, 2 Timothy, we just read this passage here in, verse, or in chapter 4. Here's, a, here's another guy that's ready to offer himself up. Verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there here is just, just like that wherefore. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. The pattern, again, that we see in both of them. So as, as, we're, as we're concluding this, the Christian life is a manifestation of God's work in us. It puts on display Christ's life in the believer, but it also requires and expects our participation and obedience of faith. God does have a rewards program. You're signed up for it. God rewards generously. He says, he says Christ says in the, in, the, in, the, in the Gospels, great is your reward. He's not, he's, not, he's not a cheapskate God. Great is your reward. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Especially in ministry, you know, when you think, well, I'm not doing this for anything. It's not adding up to anything. You never want to feel that way. You never want to think that way. We don't want to, we don't want to measure ourselves by numbers and what we're doing. It's never in vain for uh, the Lord. I'm going to read again just for time's sake. I know we're, we're out of time, so I'm just going to read this passage. When we get to the end of Paul's epistles, we get to the book of Philemon. You take all this grace doctrine and you just sum it up into one nice little neat short book. This is what it looks like. Beautiful book. Beautiful book. It just, it, it just takes everything and puts it on display and it says, this is, this is what this looks like. I, I, want you to, I want you to take this guy that was, he wasn't profitable to you before. No good. Bad fruit. Guy keeps bringing bad fruit into the house. I don't want anything that he's got. Again, he's not, he's, he's not, he's not benefiting the family. Paul says, I want you to take him back. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me. But how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? If thou count me, therefore, a partner, this is Christ talking about you, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put it on my account. He's not coming back to you now as a, as a little servant, full-grown son. A full-grown son that can now go and serve. Again, I understand that we're out of time. I'm going to say this real quickly. This is a, a family conference, a summer conference. It's a great time. This is a school conference, Great School of the Bible. We're talking about the ministry of the Great School of the Bible. If you are in the school, we say this over and over. We encourage you to continue um, to keep on keeping on, as they say, um, to endure hardness, get on a schedule. Um, there, there, is, there is a benefit to it. Um, there's others that are going to testify to that. Um, if you have somebody who's here, who's a family member, who's in the school, um, again, um, be an encouragement to them. Um, and and if, if, you do, if you do have a lot of treasure and you're trying to decide between whether or not you want to buy that million-dollar car with the ropes or whether or not you're able to um, help out, this is a great ministry to do that with. Um, Lord God, we thank you for today. Um, and we thank you for all that you've done and accomplished for us um, at the cross. And that we do magnify um, the man Christ Jesus. And it's in his awesome, wonderful name that we pray. Amen.